This patient is a 65-year-old female with dizziness and palpitations associated with non-sustained ventricular tachycardia, consistent with a right ventricular outflow tract location. Symptoms persisted despite beta blockers, and she desired catheter ablation. Informed consent is obtained from the patient while discussing the plan for the procedure as well as the risks involved. The patient is brought into the electrophysiology laboratory and defibrillation patches, grounding pads, ECG leads, blood pressure cuff, oxygen saturation monitor, and three-dimensional mapping system patches are applied. The patient is prepped in the standard fashion. Femoral access is standardly used. After prepping the areas for venous access, sterile draping is applied. The catheter cables are plugged into the appropriate locations in the mapping system computer or the pin block to allow monitoring and recording during the procedure. The operator performs a sterile scrub and dons a sterile gown and gloves. The equipment needed for the procedure should be immediately available including a local anesthetic such as lidocaine with needles and syringes, introducer sheaths of varying sizes, catheters and associated cables. In addition, a recording system and pacing stimulator are needed. Both fluoroscopy and a three-dimensional mapping system should be available. In order to obtain venous access, first feel for the femoral artery, which then identifies the location of the femoral vein about one centimeter medial to the artery. Mild conscious sedation may be appropriate. However, if the patient can tolerate using only local anesthesia over the femoral vein, there is a better chance of having spontaneous or induced PVCs or ventricular tachycardia. After adequate local anesthesia has been achieved, the femoral vein is accessed twice about 3 to 5 millimeters apart using the modified Seldinger technique. Ultrasound guidance may be desired for venous access because it allows entering only the anterior wall of the vessel, reducing the likelihood of post-procedural hematoma. After the wires are placed in the vein, the sheaths are inserted over the wires and secured in position. Once venous access is obtained, the electrophysiology catheters are inserted. Catheter placement is monitored using fluoroscopy or with a three-dimensional mapping system. The ablation catheter is advanced into the right ventricle and a three-dimensional anatomic and voltage map is made. Note how the right ventricular outflow tract tilts leftward toward the left ventricle on the LAO view screen seen in the right video. Areas of purple show normal voltage set at an amplitude above 1.4 millivolts while areas of red with an amplitude less than 0.5 millivolts show low voltage consistent with SCAR or, as in this case, the pulmonic valve. A second electrophysiology catheter, seen in blue in the left video, is then advanced into the right ventricular apex. Activation mapping using the 3D mapping system allows detection of the earliest electrogram within the outflow tract. If spontaneous ventricular tachycardia or PVCs are not present, ventricular burst pacing is performed. Programmed extra stimulation may also be completed, but is less likely to induce the arrhythmia. Isoproteranol infusion can be used to facilitate arrhythmia induction. Aminophilin, epinephrine, and hand grip exercises may also be used. If enough PVCs are seen or ventricular tachycardia is present, activation mapping using the three-dimensional mapping system is used. Points are taken and activation relative to a reference electrogram, either the right ventricular catheter or the 12-lead ECG, is color-coded on the map. Early signals are coded red and late signals are coded blue-purple.
You should see an early red area with centrifugal spread of colors outward. In this example, the patient only has rare PVCs. However, only a single PVC is needed to do pace mapping. For this, the ablation catheter is maneuvered throughout the outflow tract with pacing at an energy level just high enough to capture the myocardium. The goal is to find a location with a 12-lead ECG that perfectly matches the PVC, called a 12 out of 12 pace map. It is important to try to match as many of the small notches on the QRS as possible. Ablation is successful when performed at the earliest ventricular activation location, which is usually greater than 30 milliseconds prior to QRS onset. A QS morphology on the unipolar electrogram should be seen at this location. A 12 out of 12 pace map should also be seen. For the ablation, the radio frequency generator is programmed to the desired settings. In this case, using an open irrigated tip catheter, an energy setting of 30 watts was delivered for 60 seconds. The ablation is then started. One or several bursts of tachycardia followed by abrupt termination predicts a successful ablation location. Often, additional ablation lesions are placed near the first lesion to increase the likelihood of long-term success. After a successful ablation, there is a waiting period between 20 and 60 minutes with monitoring to assess if ventricular tachycardia or PVCs are still present. If there are no spontaneous PVCs or ventricular tachycardia during the waiting period, attempts are then made to reinduce the arrhythmia using the methods that initially induced the tachycardia, often with the reintroduction of isoproterenol. Once the waiting period has been completed and the arrhythmia cannot be reinduced, the catheters can be removed from the body. The sheaths are then removed with manual hemostasis obtained. All cables, drapes, and towels are removed from the patient. The patient is then transferred to a stretcher. It is important not to bend the legs for four to six hours after the procedure to prevent the development of hematoma. The procedure is then complete.